Welcome to the first event in the third edition of the Law in Crisis series organized by the University of Ghana School of Law with the support of GIZ. Today we have a very interesting discussion within the general legal education reform space. Anybody who has been keeping track of legal education reform in Ghana over the last few years would know that the conversations around the structure and um, aspects of legal education has been at the forefront of uh, public discourse. The COVID-19 pandemic has compelled legal educators and institutions to reflect on their modus operandi, to consider what, what, what law schools are doing and what they can do differently. So COVID-19 um, has brought greater urgency on the discussions around legal education reform. In the past, the discussions on legal education reform are focused on access, structure, things like going into professional education, etc. Today's focus is slightly different. We, the panel is looking, would be looking at a subset of that discussion on the reform of teaching and learning methods and the range of assessments that are used to evaluate teaching and learning. We think that while access to legal education remains relevant and it continues to be a topical issue, we want to recenter the conversation to really look at the content of legal education and the epistemic and pedagogical practices that surround it. Today's panel is on the reform of teaching and assessment in legal education in Ghana. It provides us an opportunity to discuss the state of the principal methods of teaching and assessment. We, we want to examine, to diagnose whether the teaching and learning methods are fit for purpose, and if they are fit for purpose, and in fact, what should that purpose be? So ultimately, we, we hope that within the space of this discussion, uh, the discussions, questions, and answers will contribute to how teaching and learning philosophies may be constructively aligned to desired learning and training outcomes for the Ghanaian law students post-COVID. I am Kenneth Gatti, lecturer at the University of Ghana School of Law, and I'm your moderator for today's event. Uh, I am joined by a very powerful four-member panel, which I, uh, I'll be introducing shortly, uh, who would contribute to uh, the discussion on today's topic on the reform of teaching and assessment in legal education. I would introduce uh, the panel and welcome them. First, uh, on, on, on uh, first panelist I'd like to introduce is Professor uh, Mrs. Lydia uh, Inkanta. Professor Inkanta is the Dean of the Faculty of Law, Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, Kumasi. She was previously a lecturer at the Ghana Institute of Management and Public Administration, where she trained members of the Parliament of Ghana and Liberia on constitutionalism and legislative processes. She served for a time as an academic instructor at the Ghana Armed Forces Command and State College. Professor Nkansa was instrumental in setting up the third public law school at the Gimpa Law School. She has been instrumental in setting up law schools, not just in Ghana, but also in Ondo State, Nigeria. She has facilitated courses at the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center on Human Rights, Transitional Justice, the Law of Armed Conflict. She has published in Constitutional Law, Transitional Justice, Legal Theory, Democratization. The profile is large. Um, uh, join me in welcoming uh, Prof. Prof. Encounter. You're welcome to the panel. Thank you very much. Thank yes. You. Uh, next, our next panelist is Pio Dr. Atudewe Atupari. Pio Dr. Atupari is a Dean of the Faculty of Law of the University of Cape Coast. Prior to joining the University of Cape Coast, uh, uh, Pio Dr. Atupari was a very valued member of the University of Ghana School of Law. Pio Dr. Atupari is a leading public law lecturer with wide ranging experience and expertise in constitutional law, jurisprudence, administrative law, employment law, labor law, and the law of thought. He's published in all these areas. Uh, Pure Dr. Tupai holds a PhD from Queen's University in Canada. As you would, you can tell from uh, Pure Dr. Tupai's title, he wears a second and even more important hat. Um, Pure Dr. Tupai is traditional ruler of Manuro, traditional area in the Upper East region of Ghana. Pure Dr. Tupai, you're welcome to the panel. Thank you. <clears throat> 
My third panelist is um, Kumerin Rodrigo. Kumerin is the teaching and learning developer at Lancaster University, Ghana, where she has developed modules in critical thinking and English for academic purposes. Kumerin holds a BA in sociology from the University of Delhi, a postgraduate diploma in women's studies from the University of Colombo, has wide ranging professional experience in other uh, professional courses. But importantly for today's conversation, Kumerin has a very strong interest in curriculum development and issues relating to constructive alignment, to really how desired teaching and learning outcomes should be matched to assessment methods. She has a postgraduate certificate in international academic practice from Lancaster University and is currently co completing an MA in education with a focus on inclusive practice from the Open University UK. Significantly, Kumarin is a fellow of the Higher Education Academy UK and is also active in the Association of Learning Developers in Higher Education UK. Kumarin, you're welcome to the panel. Thank you very much, Ken. Last but certainly not least is our panelist, Catherine Akpene Aglubice. Uh, Ms. Aglubice is a post-first degree Bachelor of Law student at the School of Law, University of Ghana. She's a research assistant with Law and Development Associates, a policy, legislative, and institutional development services group. Prior, prior to her law studies, she graduated with first class honors in sociology and French from the University of Ghana and spent a year in the University de Poitiers where she received a diploma in French language and literature. She joined the School of Law in 2018 and kindly serves as a vice president of the Law Students Union. She's passionate about women, youth and children's affairs, especially about health and education. Uh, Ms. Uh, Aglobiche would uh, give us the student's perspective on our discussions today. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you very much, Mr. Gatti. It's an honor to be part of this panel. It's, it's an honor to have you as well. So welcome to all, all our panelists. We set the ground ruling on our discussion for today. Uh, just to remind you, it's on the reform of teaching and assessment in legal education in Ghana. And we'll be examining those aspects within the context of, of COVID um, to, to understand uh, how we should proceed with this more fully. So we, we are going to, just uh, to get a sense of how the discussion is going to proceed today, we will try to situate the current legal education landscape in its historical context for flowing from that, we would examine the teaching and learning methods and the practical constraints faced by the law schools, because you can have fantastic discussions about what should be done, what can be done, what may be done, but it is it it has to be situated in the practical realities of some of the difficulties and challenges that Ghanaian law schools face. We will try to then examine. Uh, thirdly, how teaching and learning and assessment structure design should go. What should go into a good curriculum design? What should go into good assessment design? When, when, when we are done with that, uh, we will try to examine what quality in legal education should look like. What must law teachers do flowing from that to improve teaching? What must students contribute to giving effects to good teaching within Ghanaian legal education? And obviously towards the end, since our students represent uh, the ultimate beneficiaries of our teaching and learning methodologies, we would situate all of that conversation in the lived experiences of Ghanaian law students over the period of uh, some of this teaching and assessment reform discussion. And uh, thankfully, there's, we would have time to get questions and answers from our participants who have joined us on, on the various uh, uh, platforms. So we will kick off our discussion by trying to situate the current legal education landscape in this historical context. Um, I would just ask that whilst we proceed, uh, attendees may kindly put their questions in our question, if you're via Zoom in our questions in the Q&A uh, bubbles, for, uh, we would pay attention to that and uh, we would pass it on to the panelists uh, for them to be answered at the right time. Ghana's uh, legal education landscape is a bifurcated legal education system, which essentially means that training happens at the university level, focused mainly on 
theoretical so-called substantive law, and then there's a professional component at the state-run uh, uh, professional law school, the Ghana School of Law. This is the reality of how we, we've educated our lawyers for the last several decades. Uh, so I would call on Puff and Kanta to situate the reality of our legal education system now and its history in giving us a sense of how we have come from the early 60s till, till today. Puff and Kanta, over to you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Gatti, thank you very much. And a good afternoon to all the viewers. I am very honored and pleased to be part of this conversation, which is very, very, very important as far as our legal uh, education is concerned. At independence, trying to situate it within the context of uh, history, at independence, the nation realized that we didn't have enough lawyers to man the respective institutions. You need lawyers to man your governmental institutions, to also oversee to your economic sector, to look at political matters and also civil matters. So uh, Osage for at that time decided that we should pay a very a serious attention to legal education. And he took upon himself to do that because the colonial masters actually had not paid that attention uh, to it. And the discussion was what institutions should we put in place to offer legal education? And what should the institutions, uh, let's say, be teaching? What should be the educational ideology? And also flowing from that, what should even be uh, those to be uh, 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 admitted into the institutions, as well as the kind of methodology we should use. We, so I'm going to look at the history from that, that time ago. Uh, basically, by 1958, the law school was set up, and it was set up to train, give professional training at that time. And the idea behind it was that they should allow a, a police civil servant, what they refer to as a lawyer technocrats, to emerge in the country so that all these public civil servants, including letter writers, should have some form of legal education to guide them in what they do. So I refer to that as uh, the instrumentalist approach to legal education. However, it, the idea also emerged that we needed to situate legal education in the liberal art. So we had Legon establishing um, a, a law department to also run a degree program. But why did we keep the two running at the same time? We kept the two for three main reasons. The first reason being that we needed a large number of lawyers. So two institutions working to assist the nation get lawyers is okay. The second reason was that, you see, here that too, if you wanted to read law, you had to go outside the country to do it. And that there are people who have the desire to become lawyers. They don't have the opportunity. So let us have these two institutions and let's see how we can include them and to achieve their, their, their life goals or interests. Then there was also the need, this is one is a bit political. There was also the need to train lawyers from a larger social base of Ghana to be able to counter the political opponents of Osajifu at that time, I got all these things from the literature at that time, because the lawyers who were mainly in the opposition against uh, the CPP were aristocratic lawyers who had been trained, had come from a certain class. So let us now ensure that we have law for all. Every police person, anyone who is interested in becoming a lawyer, go there. You will train you for three years, and it was supposed to be a part-time program. Then you will sit, the main purpose was for the law school to allow you to sit for the UK bar, the part one and part two. So hopefully we, by sp spending three years 
in uh, Ghana Law School, you will qualify to be a lawyer. But as you see, whether we were able to go on with that. So we came to have what you described as the two system bifurcated legal education. That went on. So the two institutions as were existing uh, concurrently. Then in within a year, 1959, uh, the then Attorney General, uh, who was very instrumental in the development of uh, uh, legal education, uh, constituted an international advisory committee. And that international advisory committee, uh, at the end of the day, advised that what Ghana Law School is doing should be absorbed into what uh, the Department of Law was doing at that time. And that there was no need, and they can use the, the, the school to do the professional aspect so that after they've been trained at Legon, they will come and do one year, which because law school was being regulated by the General Legal Council, that the body that is responsible uh, for the legal education and to ensuring enrollment of people and the call of people to the bar. Uh, but this, this uh, uh, decision was not implemented. And then that, that period saw the resignation of the then dean of the, 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 the Legon uh, Law Department. So there was now another dean in place called Harvey. So when Harvey took over the deanship, his, the first thing he did was to uh, uh, tackle this issue of dual uh, legal education in Ghana. And then he made submissions to the General Legal Council and also the Legon Academic Board. The General Legal Council actually accepted. His proposal was that we shouldn't have a second tier for legal education. We should just do allow candidates to do liberal arts for three years for BA and then do LLM for two years. And after that, they'll be qualified to practice as lawyers. So General Legal Council actually accepted that proposal, but that was also not implemented at the time that uh, 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 Harvey, Dean Harvey was uh, deported from, from, from Ghana. He was actually deported. And out of these two schools, the ideology for education, I refer to them as instrumenta instrumentalist ideology and humanistic ideology. The instrumentalist ideology is a train lawyers as you would do, you would do uh, technicians, the instrumentalist, because law is the tool to effect change. And uh, uh, Osajifu and the then Attorney General felt that that was necessary because we needed lawyers. And otherwise, without having a core number of lawyers, the nation will not function properly. But the second dean who came, Harvey, had a contract, even though he believed that we needed the numbers. That was not an issue. But what was an issue was that legal education should not be taken, brought to the level of uh, uh, apprenticeship, that lawyers should be trained in the liberal arts, and then they should top it with the legal uh, aspect. Th so that if you are, we, we say that you are a lawyer, you've been called to the bar in Ghana, internationally or anywhere you find yourself, you should stand out. In fact, his words, I, I'll quote him, he said, law is a learned profession. And the lawyer who is faithful to the highest standard of the profession is not merely a skilled craftsman manipulating a technique for social ordering. So we had these two ideologies which undergird the two respective institutions. In, in any case, it also informed pe pedagogy, philosophy for pedagogy, yes, teaching uh, methodology. So, Whereas, uh, uh, not to cut you off. So uh, if we fast forward to the transition, um, to the transition into the university, going into the university before then transitioning to professional legal education. Um, if we fast forward to that time, the changes in the legislative instruments that made it a requirement to have a university degree before going on to the Ghana School of Law. 
for for this conversation yeah, yes uh, i want us to extract whether this two two systems first going into a university studying the uh, so-called substantive law and then progressing into the professional law school mm -hmm. to do the practical part of the learning did that influence the teaching methods and the assessments that we now see in our law schools in Ghana? Please, it does. I was going to move on to that. Yes. Because the, the, the do the academics at the LLB level means that the various universities, of course, the courses are regulated by the General Legal Council. So the General Legal Council gave the core courses for the uh, faculties of law to run. And that means the pedagogy for that, which is so steep in what is referred to as the doctrinal approach to learning of law. Learners, law, law students are taught to think like lawyers. They are taught to think like lawyers. What do I mean by that? To master the law, the various courses, contract, taught, the principles, and also to master the analysis of the laws, the course of the constitutional law taught, uh, whatever, to, to become masters in analysis. However, the until recently, we didn't have skill-based aspects of the curriculum. We concentrated in the teaching of the law, uh, making the lawyers, you know, kick out of them the uninstructed reasoning processes of a layman. So shape their brains to think like lawyers. And to that means be able to know the law to quote the law, to cite the law. In fact, even my time, it was more serious than this when we were students. You may even have to memorize a whole passage. Up to now, when I'm teaching my students and I get to those areas, I just bring out the quotes like that. But that was deficient because the idea is that you are going to the law school to learn the practical aspect. Yes. So that was deficient in practice. And so, that also led to deficiency in purpose. The person is studying in the law faculty, but the person does not even have an idea of the end purpose because the person is thinking, and so I want to become a lawyer. But what does that mean? What is the ideology in you becoming a lawyer? The person doesn't have a grasp of it. So it made lawyers, by the time we graduate them from the LLB, they become weak doers and sometimes also a, a, a diffuse identity, a confused identity of who they are. But now the current idea is that once you are, the end goal is for you to become a lawyer. Once you enter the law faculty, we need to emphasize all these aspects, skill-based learning, purpose-based learning, and have courses to that effect. I don't know, ethics, for example, are not being taught. We wait for the students to get to the, the practical aspect, the practical level. And then the teaching methodology is also another thing. The teaching methodology is can be can be uh, 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 can be detected or can be drawn from the two ideologies that are put there, the instrumentalist and the humanistic. Because as for the instrumentalist, just uh, give them vocational training. So the instrumentalists, in fact, that even led to political uh, Prof, we, we would, um, mm -hmm. we would We would explore that part of the conversation uh, a bit more. Okay. But I note, I note the point that you make that then with, with this idea in mind, over time, there, there was a sort of a situation in which LLB students were being taught the doctrines at the LLB level. And then there was going to be a transition into, into, into professional legal education where practical skills were, were going to be given. But the reality on the ground, if for many of us who are familiar with the Ghanaian legal education landscape, is that 
in, in the end, mm -hmm. the Ghana School of Law, which was meant to be the professional end of legal training, uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Steve Mantel, the University of Ghana School of Law, uh, writing about a decade ago, uh, described the the, the the sort of training there that it had also become a lecture-dominated type of training, where the the the, mm -hmm. the 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 practical aspect was not evident. If lawyers are going to trans go, what lawyers are expected to do is just beyond knowing and thinking about the law. Also, putting it into practice is a very important part of that conversation. So I thank you, Paul, for your point, but we will transition into our second discussion uh, by, uh, if I may pick Dr. Uh, Pure Dr. Tupai's views on, on, on the fact that th there's always um, the view, uh, Pure Dr. Tupai, that there should be a greater practical aspect of legal education. That's the rote learning and uh, timed examinations are not enough. Uh, are not enough to fully develop the kind of lawyers we want, particularly in, in this COVID, uh, the, the kind of training we can provide to students in using electronic media, et cetera. But if we want to introduce a more practicalized dimension of legal training, in North America, for example, the American Bar Association requires practical clinical skills as part of the accreditation process. Many of these North American universities have the means to employ experienced clinical professors to provide training for their students. When we talk about reform of teaching and learning, we want to practicalize this. We look at the numbers of our law students, our large classes, the, the, the provisions for public universities, et cetera. I want to pick your view, uh, Pure Dr. Tupai, that what are the practical constraints of Ghanaian law schools in, in, in the choice of teaching and assessment methods that they use, exams, sit down exams, lectures, mainly lectures and sit down exams. Well, thanks, um, Ken. You know, the, be, before that, let me just um, add that um, in respect of what Prof. Nkansan has said mm -hmm. about the beneficated um, legal training in, in the country, I, I agree with her that um, we had problems in terms of matching philosophy with, with reality. So you have a philosophy which has been developed and, and is the philosophy that is supposed to be driving training, teaching methods and what have you. But in practice, that philosophy is not there. And you, you, can, yes, you can students and then the learner objectives. So you, you have issues like uh, at the end of this, lecture or course students must be able to remember. This is about retrieving information, isn't it also? Recalling, or students should be able to understand this is about appreciation. And if you take the courses from the faculty level all the way to the, the Ghana School of Law level, these are the objectives that are there. So this idea that we are different, this is academic, this is doctrinal, and this is experiential, this is experience, this is practice, is false. It's, it's, it's a fallacy. And that, that tells us that we really don't understand the philosophy for this beautification. If we do, we should be able to have some kind of distinctions in terms of what goes on here and what goes on um, there. Otherwise, you wouldn't, be call, we, you wouldn't be requiring students to retrieve information, recall information, basically throw back what we have said. In fact, teaching uh, uh, methodologies in terms of the faculty and that of the, the, the Ghana School of Law from my experience has been uh, an admixture of content-centered um, approach. The content-centered approach is that the both the student and the lecturer are locked up in a particular prescribed content that you don't go out of it. And, and then um, we, don't, we don't want to make any excuses. If you miss it, you miss it. And um, there's, there's no room for, so, for some kind of uh, examination. And at the same time, there, there, there is some kind of teacher-centered, which is that he's an authority. So we, we, we are not going to be able to explore other options and things like that. So you, you have that at the faculty and you also have that at the Ghana School of Law. So what, what, what is the difference in a way? And, and uh, I don't think that we, we have recognized, we have, we have some recognition of a common purpose for the two um, entities. That is the faculty and then the, the institutions that are purporting to be training. Uh, as at the practical level. We don't, we don't have a recognition of a, a common purpose as to where we're going. I think that um, generally 
that there's an embodiment of legal education in this in, in, in this case. It's about lawyering, professionalism, and, and legal analysis. And we don't have that um, and, and, and in terms of joining them together from day one. We, we try to say that they are separate, but in, in terms of practice, really are running um, you know, apart with, with, with that kind of conception. And I, I think that is important. Before you proceed, uh, Pierre, uh, Doctor, I, I, I would like to, but do we see that there is value in putting a more practical element in training our lawyers and future law students? Do we see that? Do, what, what do you say about that? Before you go into examining the practical constraints of Ghanaian law schools in delivering this more so-called modding type of uh, teaching and learning. And we can say for, for on one hand that yes, we do. Um, as a country, recognize the value of lawyers. We do recognize the, the benefits that will be conferred on us as a society if you have people properly trained as lawyers and, and then pe people practicing what they're supposed to be practicing. I think that there's no department in this country where the service of a lawyer would not be required um, from the ministry's level all the way to the, the district, district assembly. So that channel um, recognition um, is there for all of us. The point is, have we made the efforts um, to, to actually reflect this desire, to reflect this purpose, this need to have the lawyers um, trained? Uh, that is where the problem is going to, is going to come. Um, in terms of the, the players, um, who, who are, uh, are, the, are in charge of this um, idea of training in terms of um, the stakeholders who are supposed to be making the necessary decisions and what have you. And mind you, uh, as I, my colleague will be talking about the technical issues so far as assessments are concerned, we do have a problem. And the problem is that we, we, we need to recognize that there is there's, there's, there's something we might recall cost assessment institutional mm -hmm. assessment, program assessment. Because the focus of us in this country is, is actually about inputs, not outputs. The inputs here, we're going to look at the credentials of faculty members. We're going to look at the credentials of students who are admitting, mm -hmm. right? And that is how we evaluate people in this country. We evaluate the legal education of faculties in this country. But the output would be, um, what, what is the reflection? If you have course objectives and you say at the end of the day, students should be able to learn, the students will be able to know that. What, what is the measurement that they, they, they know that when they are out there, right? What's the measurement? What do we have? What methods can we deploy to be able to uh, get this kind of um, idea or evidence that really students are leading to the objectives, they're leading to the learning objectives that we've set for ourselves. And of course, in, in respect to the legal profession, we don't have. And that is, that is something that we need to think seriously uh, about. If, if we get to that point, we'll, we'll, flesh, we'll flesh out those, those arguments um, out. But for, for, for the constraints, as Ken, um, Prof. in Kansas has said about from 1958, 59, we have only one faculty. And students those days, I'm not sure, they are more than in, uh, 60. When I was in University of Ghana, they, they, they have, uh, I mean, as an undergrad, before joining the Faculty of Law, they had about 60, 60 students. And they have what we call maximum of fire. You will have LLB students being 40 and BA will be uh, about 20 of, of the 60. So that, that kind of uh, context. So you, you have a, a smaller, a relatively smaller class. At the time I entered the Faculty of Law, we, are, we, we were about 88, and we were crying that we were, we, were, we were so many in the class, and we were crowded, and, and there were issues here and there, isn't it so? Now, currently, we, we do have over 10 faculties with high numbers of students who are struggling to, 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 to study law. And, 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 and the, folk, the number of faculties plus the, the number of students is actually a reflection or is partly a reflection of what is happening um, today in terms of what teaching met methods uh, can be deployed in terms of uh, assessment methods that should, 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 should be used. And le le let's, let's understand this in this context that the number of faculties we have at, uh, in the country, the number of students that we have um, in the country are not, necess are not only the practical difficulties or the practical constraints that would, you know, um, 
force somebody to adapt a, a particular teaching method that will help students or facilitates understanding, teaching, or learning. Uh, we also have other constraints, for instance, and this is very important that as, as faculty, we should take that into account, that yes. we, really, we really lack a need-based principle in terms of recruitment. When people have been recruited at the various faculties, we really don't conduct any assessment as to whether or not this particular person with this skill, knowledge, and value is required. We are, we are driven by attempts or we are driven by accreditation demands to meet accreditation requirement. Bring a PAD, and if you don't have a PAD, you can't be employed at this, at, at this level. So it, if you conduct some kind of um, survey, Ken, I, I, I challenge you to do that. You realize that there are certain, <laughs> there are certain faculties in this country where 80% of them are public law lawyers. They are public law specialists. And, and because of that, in terms of distribution of courses uh, or allocation of courses for them to teach, they're going to be giving private law courses, for instance, contracts, um, torts, and, 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 and this, is, this is not your area of specialization. When you went on for graduate, you said that graduate studies is important for teaching. So why should I go and study land law and come and be teaching criminal law? Mm. Senior, some senior colleagues think that that's not important. Um, th this is um, this is basic. We should teach and 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 what have you. And I think that it is not so basic because the co the embodiment of competency in legal education is knowledge, skill, and values. So mm. even if he has the skill, he has the values because of the professional training. You're going to have a problem with the knowledge aspect. And this is where uh, this is where what you teach, how you're going to teach it. Is going to be a problem for you as a as, as a lecturer. And you, mm -hmm. you can have some evil design courses. And it, well, I say evil design because if you say this is criminal law, but the person is going to teach course, subjects or topics that the person is comfortable with, and this is something that is unacceptable. It's unacceptable for us. And those are some of the difficulties or the constraints that we dictate what kind of method, what kind of approach should a, a, a teacher, a law teacher in a class take. You are a private law person asked to teach a public law. What do you do? You get that. So, and, and pure, pure doctor, uh, uh, Atubai, in essence, you, 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 you are saying that the, uh, the inability to expand the scope of teaching methods, the inability to employ perhaps newer or more modern or more effective learning methods is one is from accreditation issues an inability to evaluate a need to for the law schools to know what they actually need in terms of the distribution of value values and knowledge of, of the potential law lecturers etc yes Is that in, in, in terms of in, in addition like the first ones would be the the large numbers now we now have in our class if you have a large class you know it actually would would dictate what method you should be somebody but, might but, want to but, but one may say that you can still have a large class, but if the law schools are financially endowed, they can employ more people, perhaps like that North American schools, if they have the means, they could get clinical professors who would you know, come and promote the, the more practical aspects, maybe at the Ghana School of Law, for example, if they had, if the systems allowed, the, the training would provide a more practical component as the philosophies or the policies underlying it expect. What do you say I, finally I, to that? I, I agree. I agree with you, but you, you can you can serialize them. One mm -hmm. large class, of course, if you have a large class where the person is the only teacher in that class, and uh, you are supposed to have some methods of assessment. For instance, you have you you, you need to have what we call formative assessment, and formative mm -hmm. assessment will be interim. That is, geared at giving uh, effective feedbacks to the students. Uh, and this helps the, the teacher to be able to know that I am going wrong, uh, things are not going well, or the, the learners to know that, no, I am not getting it, I need to adjust. That is formative. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. summative is when you evaluate the student's uh, competency at the end of, of the course, isn't it? Also, that's where we are grading, exams and things like that. So if you have a large class, would the person be able to, pro to, to engage in this formative um, assessment? That's why you have some people just saying, oh, even though they are saying they are IAS, I'm doing my 100%. He 
he's doing his ah. 100% because he's not able to burden himself for herself, isn't it so? So the student missed that quality of feedback, effective feedback, and then the lecturer also misses the opportunity to learn from the students, isn't it so? So it's a very important component of large classes that are coming up, and then um, many you know faculties that have been you know shot up here and there. And then the resources you mentioned are very very important. Of course. You might want to engage part timers, even if you don't have um, the, the 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 clearance to employ uh, lecturers, full time lecturers. Can't we engage part timers in, in, in from town? Can't we engage industry players? Right? Um, not everybody who wants to be at the faculty, but there, 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 there might be a desire for such a person in industry, relevant industry, to help. You don't have the resources, and sometimes we even look at um, the rates that have been given to those guys. Uh, mm -hmm. don't, don't forget, some people will say, yes, uh, it's patriotic service. Uh, let, let go and help your people and all kinds of things. It depends on who, you, who is going to be listening to this argument and who, who is going to, add, what, what kind of, what side of your ear is, is that information coming from and things like that, yes. and the context. So you cannot yep, provide exactly. a universal exactly. rule and say that um, anybody who hears that she jumps at this patriotic service principle argument or propaganda and come to your aid. So you have no money. So for me, um, it's important that th they are well resourced. Um, and it's important that even if we're not well resourced, we should, we should be able as faculties to actually talk about internal generated um, funds. What, what, what kind of um, uh, actions are we going to, to undertake? Can we do short courses? Can we do... Um, a pay for courses that can bring relevant industry and others to consume and pay. And Before, on that of which... mm -hmm. be, be, uh, th thank you, uh, Pew Doctor uh, Tubai. Uh, I would like a student's perspective from Catherine, especially since we are talking from a teacher's dimension. So I'd like a student's perspective on these constraints because more often than not, we are likely to 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 be the one, the administrators, like the deans on one side, the law lecturers on one side, and we forget that a, a very important stakeholder are the students or essentially the people who would uh, who would see the true value of any changes we're making. Catherine, any, any, any views on this point before we move, we move on to our other discussion? Okay, thank you, Kenneth. Um, I think it's, it's, it's wonderful and it's, it's wonderful to finally hear the perspective of, of the deans, as you are saying, because then for a long time, looking at the last aspects, um, which um, P.O. Dr. Tupari raised, having to do with um, assessment, students hearing back from the lecturers and lecturers hearing back from the students. I think for a long time, students never understood why it is not done in most cases or, or it's not taking us seriously. And I think for the first time, we are actually understanding that it has an issue to do with the numbers. And it's, it's, it makes sense, it's realistic, it's reasonable. You don't expect one lecturer to have one-on-one -on -one conversations and assessments with over 150 students in one class. And, and it, 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 it's, it's I believe that uh, there are uh, a few challenges with the. Um, it makes sense. And I think uh, we, 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 that we lost you for a moment. If you can rehash that point. Sorry, is, is it better now? Yes, uh, if you can only repeat your last few points. OK, so I was only agreeing with Pio Dr. Atopari and saying it's wonderful to hear from the aspects of the deans and the lecturers because as students, we often wonder why we are not getting feedback on our assessment. And if the lecturers or deans are not bothered about our assessment of their work. And I think for the first time we are hearing that there is the issue of numbers. And I, I, I find it reasonable that then you don't expect one lecturer to be getting feedback from 150 students and 150 students to expect feedback from one single lecturer. Mm -hmm. So we are hoping that then with this conversation and with the reformation that we are looking at um, as the result of this conversation, 
then the deans and the lecturers can do what is necessary, bring more people on board, um, reconsider the numbers, the lecturer students ratio, such that then the assessment is there, the students know what they are doing wrong, and the lecturers can also find out from the students what they need from them to be able to right. do better or do better. Right. Um, it's, a, it's a good point to go transitioning into the next stages of our, of our conversation. Um, when students know how they are going to be ass assessed, uh, it, it, goes, uh, it determines to a large extent how they, they, they study. When, when students know how they're going to be assessed, it goes to a, a large extent, it contributes to how they, they would be, they study. Because when a student knows that all that is required of them is rote learning, the focus becomes just studying the book, the, the defined pages, etc. So when you think about assessment, assessment is meant to create, is plays a very crucial role in the teaching and learning and assessment structure design. The type of assessment you give to the students can influence what educators call, can influence whether they are minded to deep learning or shallow learning. And especially in this COVID time when students are not within the classrooms and are in their private homes, uh, following classes online, et cetera. Learning and assessment design is a very important part of it. Uh, Pure Dr. Tupai already made reference to the difficulties in the structure of the learning outcomes that Ghanaian law schools from the LLB stages up to the Ghana School of Law craft out. And thankfully, Kumarin is here to provide a perspective on uh, what should go into good teaching and learning assessment structure design. But before that, I would I would give a minute or two to Prof Encanta to make some comments on um, Pure Dr. Tupai's point before I, I move on to um, Kumarin to explore uh, what should go into good teaching and learning assessment. Instructor, uh, Prof. Uh, one more, uh, a minute or two. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Gatti. Um, I'm a doctor, as spoken, Doctor Pio. I hope I'm I've, I'm correctly pronouncing it. Pio doctor. It is Pio doctor. Has, yes. Pio doctor has almost exhausted um, all the constraints we face in our respective mm -hmm. law faculties. I just want to bring the dimension of the political aspect. We need mm. to have lawyers, we need to train them well, then we need to also ensure that we have what it takes to undertake the training. For example, we need to have teachers. We need to have teachers, but we, we can't go out to hire, except we get the um, clearance from government. And government gives numbers periodically to the universities. And then the universities will also share the numbers across the various faculties and departments. We don't seem to have control over that. Meanwhile, people in of Ghana desire to come and study law, and they come in their numbers. You imagine the new set of uh, people, the free uh, uh, SHS education. We are now going to have a whole chunk of people who would apply and will show interest to come and study law. Yet, we know we need to keep the NAP threshold in terms of standards. Uh, student teacher ratio. So even for law, because of lack of uh, teachers, instead of 118, they've even make it. Uh, they've even made it 1.27 for us. But it's still difficult to address this constraint. But I'm saying that some of the constraints are beyond us mm. and mm. go into the wider political fear. So I think our stakeholders should also have years on that. And then again, we also need to have commitment for mm -hmm. our respective universities that you decide that you want to do a law faculty. Then it takes A, B, C, D, and they have to commit themselves to that. Otherwise, uh, it, that aspect, I just wanted to bring the aspect which 
Seems we we would explore that when wonder. we come to consider what quality should look like. So okay. after Kumarin situates okay. us into what should go into teaching and learning and assessment structure design, we would we would all have a conversation around the kind of quality that we want okay. to see in Ghanaian legal education in order to have the kind of lawyers that we, we hope to train uh, for the future who would be able to uh, live up to the name that we, we want them to have. So uh, Kumarin, I, I would go over to you. Deep learning, shallow learning in this COVID environment, what can law schools and law teachers learn from good assessment, good teaching and learning and assessment structure design? Thank you, Kenneth, for your question. Um, listening to this conversation has been very enlightening, illuminating, and I've really enjoyed not just understanding how legal education is structured and how it's enacted, but also how it uh, relates to the principles of curriculum design and development. So one of the main principles that we look at in teaching and learning development is a principle of constructive alignment. I'm sure you've heard about it. Um, and constructive alignment has two elements. The constructive part of it is how the student, the learner, constructs knowledge for themselves. Students, as we know, are not blank slates. They don't walk into a classroom and have knowledge poured into them or transmitted. They listen, they engage to different levels, and then they construct the knowledge that they take away based on how they interact with what is being taught to them. So that is a constructive part of it. The alignment is what's particularly relevant to this discussion, which is how the different components of the curriculum, so the curriculum itself, the intended learning outcomes, how they're aligned to the assessments. And then of course, how both the teaching and the learning activities are designed in a way that facilitates um, students' achievement at those assessment tasks. Now that in particular is really uh, essential to this discussion. Um, listening to um, here Dr. Atupare, for example, he talked about um, the objectives the intended learning outcomes of legal education. And he mentioned particularly uh, verbs like remember, understand. Um, these are known in teaching and learning development as uh, sort of surface learning verbs. There's a taxonomy of um, learning um, verbs that is uh, called Bloom's taxonomy. And that goes from verbs like, I'm checking it right now, uh, remember, understand. And then from there, it builds up into apply, analyze, evaluate, create. And the question that we were talking about earlier in this discussion about how um, we don't know for certain if legal students, law students, actually are assessed on the knowledge that they need to have also comes back to how the intended learning outcomes are framed. If you're going to frame something in terms of remember and understand, it kind of implies wrote memory. But if you're looking at verbs like evaluate, analyze, apply, create, and the contingent verbs that go with it, then you're looking at more active, engaged learning, deeper learning, as you talked about in your introduction. So that is one aspect of learning design and development and constructive alignment that could be looked at. The other is both the teaching and the learning uh, activities that lead to the assessment. And the assessment itself draws directly from um, the learning outcomes. So if you, if you want students at the end of this course or this module to be able to apply the knowledge they have learned, interpret something, create something, then of course the assessments directly draw from those verbs. And then the teaching and learning activities also are designed to facilitate how the students really can't escape learning. So the teaching activities are what the teacher does and how the teacher sets the stage for the student to learn. The learning activity is basically the scaffolding that makes sure that the student learns what they are supposed to learn, takes away what they're supposed to take away and is able to demonstrate the skills that they will need for real world um, careers and real world activity in this case in the legal profession. So that is the underlying principle of constructive alignment. That is, even at Lancaster University Ghana, this is how we tend to structure our modules, our programs. Um, and it has worked to the extent that 
when you're also setting um, learning objectives, this is part of the discussion that went on before, you also have to look at applicability in the real world. Once students leave university, where are they going to work? How are they going to work? What skills do they need as lawyers? Is it just, um, if, you're, if you're training students to just sit and memorize, write exams, that's not the only skill they need as lawyers. They also need to be able to negotiate, to present, to interact, to interpret. Are those skills also being um, addressed in the curriculum design and development? So then you kind of look at the industry, the law and legal industry, as it were, to get an idea of what purpose these skills would serve for students once they graduate. So then from the student it, it, it is, um, my apologies, it, it is one of the difficulties and I'd like you to touch on that shortly. So we, we have a situation in which what the learners are required to do post-qualification differs greatly from what um, they are subjected to during the training. Um, if you examine Prof, uh, Professor Chris Rust's seminal paper on uh, his principles of assessment, he says that any good assessment must be reliable, it must be valid, and then it must have relevance and transferability. But now we have a situation in which most Ghanaian law schools have timed examinations, there's no role plays, neither is there active mooting participation, especially also because of this philosophy that there's at, at, at the graduate training level, it's substantive or doctrinal, and then at the professional end, out of the blue, suddenly it becomes a practical. What, what advice is there for, for aligning these teaching and learning objectives with, with assessment that is predominantly used in Ghanaian law schools? Um, in terms of aligning teaching and learning objectives with assessment, um, I think it was Pierre Dr. Atifari who talks about um, both formative and summative assessment. Mm. So the summative assessment is, of course, the exam or the final, um, the different types of final assessments, we should say, that contribute to us the grade and the student's um, certification. Now, one pro problem of having only an exam is that it's really high stakes. Yeah. Everything hinges on that one examination, and, and it is quite limited in, in both the skills and the environment that it presents to the learner. So one way that maybe legal education could look at um, aligning assessments with intended learning outcomes is to diversify the range and breadth of uh, summative assessments. It's not just um, written exams, but also moot codes and debates. Um, presentations, uh, dissertations, individual research, different uh, assessments that test the skills that they will need, the critical skills they need as lawyers once they graduate. And instead of putting the onus only on the apprenticeship before being called to the bar, um, mm. depending on how the system works. So one is to diversify the range of assessments. The other is, as your Dr. Atapar said, um, the formative assessment stage is really important. And I, I feel that maybe not just in uh, the School of Law, but in lots of universities globally, um, the aspect of formative assessment isn't given enough attention. Formative assessment um, is not just um, for the student, it is for the teacher. So it informs teaching, as we said before, but it's also diagnostic. It helps the teacher to see where certain students might have certain gaps in knowledge or and as individuals or even as a class. So the formative assessment provides the scaffolding, provides the, the rungs for the student to get to that level. And uh, that is another area. I'm not sure if that exists currently in legal education in Ghana, but that is another area that could be paid attention to. Right. to answer the question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a good point to transition into the rest of our discussion. If you're just joining us by any of uh, the social media platforms or if you're a participant on Zoom, you're welcome to the Law and Crisis Seminar and on the panel of the Reform of Teaching and Assessment in Legal Education in Ghana. The Investor of Ghana School of Law is uh, supported by GIZ in bringing you this uh, first event in the third series of the Law and Crisis Seminars. Um, we've, we've had the discussion about the shortfalls, the constraints, what should be good. I'd like for us now to transition into considering what should quality, what should quality in legal education look like? 
uh, what should it ultimately reflect? And we, perhaps we can tack on the next discussion uh, that we, we were hoping to have about what can law teachers contribute to improving uh, teaching and assessment quality? It, it, we, it is not possible just to throw up our hands in the air and say there are constraints, there are high student numbers, there are low lecturer numbers. Even with the resources that we have, what should quality look like and um, uh, what, what can law teachers contribute to improving teaching and learning assessment uh, quality in legal education? I, I'll start with you, Pio Dr. Atupari. Thank you, Ken. Um, let me just tie in, just, just one minute, tie in these two points in terms of the constraints. Um, there, there's something we might call the sociology of the class. That's one point, that's one constraint. And then another, which we call the psychology of the class. The sociology of the class um, is basically the difference and inequality of the exiting points of the students who are coming to the faculty. So, you know, you have some of these faculties who admit HND, others who admit um, even people with third classes, you know, in terms of how we prescribed, which university is coming from, how it's been trained. So it, it becomes an issue in terms of what kind of method you're going to use and how effective that method is going to be. Because you have all amalgam of students sitting in one class where the exiting point is not the same in terms of quality. So you are, you are likely to, to have a problem. And the psychology here is very fundamental. And this is something that is predominant in this country. Uh, it is about what is the motivation for a person coming to the law school? Is it because he's jobless, he has finished with BA or BAC and search for in the job market for uh, two, three years without job is really hard. And, and there's some kind of uh, expectation from the village that you begin to contribute to family life is it that that brought you to the faculty so you actually don't have any desire to study law it's just that you don't want to keep on searching for job without and you think that coming to the faculty of law is is is, is one of the ways to kill this um so there are some people who can talk about prestige it's just prestige others will say that yes my father was a lawyer also want to become a lawyer. The more these diverse motiv uh, motivations for the entrance can actually be a challenge, can be a constraint as to what appropriate teaching methodology I'm going to um, to deploy. Then to the question about what should should um, uh, quality um, education, legal education reflect. Ken, this one I would, I, I would say that we should ask ourselves two fundamental questions, especially um, what quality should it reflect. The first fundamental question is what does uh, what 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 um, does law school um, want students to know and um, be able to do upon completion? So what, what what do we want students to know and be able to uh, do upon completion? So if 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 we're able to get this question, first fundamental question, then we should be thinking about what will go into you know, the, the, the training, what will go into the teaching, and what will go into everything that embodies the students at the end of the day. And the second fundamental question is, how would we know um, that students get this knowledge upon completion? How will we know? So it's not just about turning out thousands of students or turning out um, uh, thousand applicants who have been called to the bar, but the intended purpose for which they've been called, how do we know that they actually achieve these competences. Competences here in this case will be um, the knowledge, the skill, and the values that entailed legal education in this country. And for me, if, if we get to this point, you realize that we cannot just evaluate schools by knowing which specific courses they are offering. Because sometimes the evaluation tends to be like this faculty, what courses are they offering? What specific courses are they offering? So they go to the traditional courses, or oh, they are just uh, the seven uh, traditional courses. That's okay. They have fulfilled the requirements of setting up a law faculty. Isn't you know, so? We ignored the aspect, which is um, what are the competences obtained upon completion? So the quality is not just to go and evaluate school, accredit school or faculties, okay them, and say that you are good to go, you are checked, you have fulfilled all the checklists. We need to be able to find out what are the competences obtained by these products. In that case, you realize that in this country, we don't have what, what we call an assessment plan or standards in these processes. We don't have. 
So immediately the schools, uh, uh, we get to the faculty and we know that these specific courses are listed, which are traditional courses, which have been offered since 1957 as a faculty. Then the faculty is okay to go. We ignore the aspect which is competencies obtained upon completion. And we only get this information when we are listening to judges. Ah, this man appeared before me today and is about to move a motion and it's a disaster like a casual conversation. You do not need a judge to conduct a survey on your products to, to let you understand that the competences you intend to, 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 to give to the students, they don't have that. Are we able to have an assessment plan that takes into account what we want students to know and what we want students to do upon completion and whether or not we are able, we are, we are able to impact um, uh, these things uh, uh, onto the students? What, 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 are the, what, what are the results? What is it, where is the evidence? That's Good the enough. first aspect. Uh, Peer Dr. Tupai, so in, in, in a minute, what can we do as law teachers to improve the situation that we find ourselves in? First of all, Ken, we have to deploy, for me, we have to understand the psychology of the class, understand mm. the sociology of the class. In this case, the psychology is the exiting points are different. The psychology is that they have diverse motiv motivations for coming. So in that case, you need to understand these two elements and deploy appropriate teaching methods, mm -hmm. appropriate teaching methods that would help or facilitate the understanding of the various courses. Uh, you being a teacher and they being learners, there should be some kind of interaction mm -hmm. for them to understand, appreciate what you are going on. And I, and I agree with uh, Komarun when she, she, she was talking about the verbs. Um, sometimes we say, in the course of objectives that will, at the end of the day, the students should be able to evaluate. But when you are looking at the marking schemes, you are actually saying that at the end of the day, the students should be able to remember. You get it. So the focus is on remembrance. The focus is not on evaluation. The focus is not on application. So the student knows that whether these things you have on paper, on paper and then you have done by admin, is not a reflection of what is going to happen. So I better get set up to be able to um, to remember, to retrieve information, to recall information. And I must have a, a storage of this information. Otherwise, I am doomed, dead, gone, and buried. Isn't it so? So you cannot deploy the appropriate teaching methods if you don't understand these things. And in that case, I agree with Conrad as well that there should be a combination of formative uh, and then summative teaching, uh, sorry, assessment uh, techniques in terms of dealing with the students. It's important the student gets feedback from you for you to be able to learn from them that I need to change or, or what I'm doing, I am actually go on, on track. Or for the students to know that, look, I need some kind of, of, of uh, a shift in my thinking, in my approach, in my style, in my, my attitude. And in, in this case, this is what is lacking in this country, the formative aspect that we are not actually available to the students. We are not available in terms of providing effective feedback and, and hours, um, what we call student hours with the lecturers, uh, are basically uh, absent. And sometimes they are platforms for castigation, weakening the spirit of students. They're not actually platforms where the students uh, are given the effective feedback that is required, right? The student know you are the teacher, so there's no way you are going to actually sit the student down and be talking about, you know, this is rubbish, this is shit, this, that. No, nobody wants to come for a feedback and get this from you. Is it not so? And that is very yeah. important. So we should combine those two. Then for me, we should have separation of powers. Ken, this separation of powers I'm talking about is not a reference <laughs> to constitutional law. The separation of powers I'm talking about is that, see, judges have, judges, in fact, have no business, judges who have no academic orientation. And this is very important for me. Judges who have no academic orientation have no business in legal education. They have no business. That's my view. But there are judges who have academic orientation. And I pick, I pick an example. Say, Dennis has been writing. He's a very good writer. He has helped us. Justice Marfusau has done that and, and, and what have you. And I'm saying so because in respect of this, our bifurcated legal system where we're producing and then there's a, a, receive, a receiving point, which is Ghana School of Law. You have entrance exams, which is being said by academics, and then you have some judges marking or you have some people who, whose orientation is not academic, actually dealing with academic papers or dealing with academic um, 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 exams. 
I don't think that is that is very important. So we need to actually have separation of powers in, in terms of this legal education. We should have research and publication. Law, law teachers should be able to do research. Most of us, if you go through the law faculties, it's like it's a, stamp, a standard um, template when we are talking about a um, uh, uh, course that line. Most of these faculties copied course outlines from other faculties for accreditation, and they don't change them. That's very important. It's very important for you to know that, yes, you copy to for an attorney general, which was decided in 1980 and published in 1980, but there are recent cases which, which actually attempt to explain it. In fact, conduct some serious useful analysis for the student to understand to for an attorney general. So you citing stone to form an attorney general does not mean that they are not recent cases. You should be able to do some some kind of research. Bring the students up. You should be able Great. to publish. Great. You should be able to publish textbooks and what have you. Above all, you, sh you should be very, very um, uh, mindful of the fact that law, law teachers need incentives. Mm. So, and this is very political. In UK, you have what we call Law Teachers Act, where in terms of salary, in terms of how they are motivated, incentivized, is different. Mm -hmm. So in, 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 in the country, we are told that you need to have a PhD to, to come and teach law. And then you, when you get a PhD and come, your, your students who are turned out, I mean, those who are called to the bar, you have taught them, they've been caught to the bar, his first year at the Attorney General Department. The salary of such a student is more than you, the, the teacher, in, 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 in the faculty of law. They are, they are likely to say, ah, yes, that's your choice. Uh, you decided to be at the faculty of law, and that person decided to be at the AG. I don't think that is right. That I can that, 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 that is so. Uh, we acknowledge your point, and I know that they, they may sound controversial, but uh, certainly uh, rightly so. Uh, rightly <laughs> so. Uh, in this in this context, I'd like to move. Uh, thank you, the Pure Doctor Atipa. I'd like to move to uh, um, uh, Dean Puff and Cancer to to share your views on what quality should look like, and then what law teachers to to have your answer together. That what should quality look like and what can we law teachers contribute to ensuring this quality in legal education, teaching and learning and assessment quality? Thank you very much, Mr. Gatti. Uh, for me, quality in legal education should have three major components and which I refer to as an integrated pedagogy, integrated. We need to ensure that we have, we do the expert doctrinal training, especially now that our students write entrance exams to the law school. Because if you have a situation where you train them, you use every other means and they don't pass, that becomes a problem. Because now, and I'll go on to say that, in building on it, there is a need for the General Legal Council, IEA, to come out with a curriculum for the entrance exams. I believe in that, a curriculum for the entrance exams, because it becomes a contract that this is what we expect. Of course, they've given the investors the um, uh, core courses, but I don't think that is enough. We need to have a, a curriculum which will talk about the objectives, which will talk about the, the, the learning outcomes, everything, and which they should know that they will face in the examination so that we don't spring surprises on them. So for me, quality, it starts with the integrated approach. I, I think I mentioned it. Yes. Expertise on the doctrine and make sure that we carry it through Otherwise, we spring surprises on them. Then but, oh, we need to it, have. Uh, sorry to intervene, but in a minute or two, we what I, I'd like for our conversation to explore. We, okay. we, you know, in the broader reform conversation, there's 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 been focus on what the general legal counsel should do. What, but okay. what can we on this side of of of, okay. of, of the of the room <laughs> do as law teachers? 
Let me, me before you go that. on, I before you go on, Puff, I, I should say to all our participants that you may use the Q&A function in Zoom to ask questions in, in, a, in, a, in a few minutes, we would set your questions to our panelists for answers. So I encourage our attendees to ask their questions using the Q&A function in Zoom. Thank you. Go ahead, please, Puff. Okay. So, so at our level as law teachers, first and foremost, I think that we need to assess ourselves as a law teacher and ask yourself, am I exercising leadership in teaching? What do I mean by this? For example, as a teacher, how do you prepare to go to class? How do you meet up the expectations of your, your students? This, there are some, some of these things. How do you motivate your students? I would want to say that you need to create this one. You don't need any external support. You should be able to create the enabling environment that will allow learning to go on. Start with respecting the timetable. Mm. Why am I saying? Start with respecting the timetable. That shows the students the seriousness taking place and also shows that you respect them. You don't postpone your lectures or few minutes to lectures, you send a message to the students that the lecture, the, the, the class is postponed to this. Please, I think at our end, we have to first respect the timetable. Then at the faculty level, we shouldn't assume that if you employ someone, then you first you find the person that goes go and teach. No. We need to have one policies on pedagogy in place, which we have thought through and designed. At the university level, the universities have teaching pedagogies, I mean, which applies to all of us. But we should go beyond that to save it and mainstream it to our own uh, uh, purposes at our level. So we need to have that. And when a person is employed, we hand the person the policy, and we also give the person a training orientation in what is expected of him or her. I know of a situation where somebody was, I worked in one institution. So she said, Alita, is that all to it? We don't just send a person to the classroom when you haven't prepared him. So we need that kind of policy. Then we have to have our students in mind. We need to have an understanding of what the general training of a law student is supposed to amount to. If you don't have this understanding, it's really not so much about you. If you don't have that understanding, you take it anywhere. So I think I want to emphasize that at our level, these are not things that you need support or funding from anybody. We have to have the policy. We have to train people before we send them to class. And they themselves should also know that they have to exercise leadership in teaching. And they have to respect students. You don't just go to class and terrorize. This, you know, we, we our pedagogy, one we use so very much is the Socratic uh, approach. We now, it has come over and over again that it has limitation. So we need to have integrated aspects. Then as I, I will also move on to say that we should revise our curriculum every, so every now and then. We don't have to just sit on one. Doctor has already pointed out. And for years, use the same thing. Uh, law clinic, role playing, in, that in interviewing skills, uh, clinical legal education, of course, we have all of that here as part of what we do. But we need, but it's, it's just a, 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 a bit aspect of the percentage. The, the huge percentage is the teaching we do, the usual business. But we need to emphasize this. And we need to also, in terms of motivating, the students are already confused. When I say they are already confused, when they come to school, first year, the enthusiasm is there. Second year, it's, it starts going down because they are moving to the reality of getting to final year and knowing whether they will make it to the law school or they will not make it to the law school. So that becomes something we need to tackle. We need to have periodic counseling 
this may not be too the, the hard side. Periodic counseling, the tutorship, the tutorship um, uh, 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 scheme, where every lecturer, uh, we um, I mean every lecturer is responsible for maybe 20 students or so. So every so often you engage them and you engage them, especially when their grades are going low. You have to engage them to know how to help them to fix it. These are all very, very, very important. Then the atmosphere you create in class as a law lecturer, the atmosphere, you should know who you are, your, your persona. Some of us think that when we go to class and you, you terrorize, I don't know, you say, oh, this lecture is hard. Of course, we have, this is what we have also um, inherited from how our lecturers may be uh, behaved towards oh, us, yes. the, the attitude towards us. Mm. So yeah. we also think that, oh, for a law lecturer, I can remember my first class as a law lecturer. You need to go in a certain, with a certain posture that something Draw. like you are no nonsense talk. Yes, strong and decisive. Yes, <laughs> those, yes. Those, uh, prof. Those, those come. Um, yeah. So I, I I get that you're saying that we must focus on providing pastoral care to our students. That if we want to quality, it comes from us uh, understanding what our teaching responsibilities are, respecting our students by mm -hmm. sticking to our timetables, uh, focusing on improving our course outline and teaching. Uh, outcomes and yeah. put, putting greater attention on our assessment, etc. Uh, thank you, uh, Prof, for that. Um, I see that uh, we are joined by over, uh, at some point, 110, uh, 103 participants, making 110 viewers on Zoom. We are, we are thankful that all of you have made the time to join us. I see many um, lecturers from other uh, faculties of law join us. I'm, we're happy to receive your questions and comments which we would share towards the end of our session. Now I would move to you, Kumarin, an outsider's perspective on, on the discussion that we have had. And then uh, I go to Catherine to provide us a, the, 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 the student uh, view on, on, on all our discussion. What's your outsider's perspective to our discussion on what quality should look like, Kumarin? Uh, thank you, Kenneth, for your question. Um, I was really struck by something that uh, Professor Nkansu just said. She said, this is mm -hmm. what we have inherited. Um, mm -hmm. And that's quite a striking statement because I was thinking all along from the discussion that ensued before that, that the, the primary thing that um, law lecturers and you as lawyers bring to the table is your experience, yeah. um, how you have studied the law. So what you have inherited is not necessarily what you need to continue with. Mm -hmm. um, I think Dr. And, uh, Dr. Atifari talked about um, formative feedback, for example, which is often not really a main part of the curriculum, or if it is, he said it is a, um, a platform for castigation, which again is striking because in um, maybe if, if as an example, uh, you look at um, how you reformat, how you give formative feedback. Um, in terms of formative feedback in teaching development and learning development, we talk about the feedback sandwich where of course there is negative feedback to be given. No one's always perfect and there are things that need to be corrected. But of course you sandwich that between um, a positive comment and then you finish with another positive comment. And that might also um, go towards um, alleviating some of the, the confusion and the um, negativity that, that uh, Professor Nkansa said students face as they progress further and further in law school. Um, and having that sort of um, structure that helps to build students. At the end of the day, everything we do is focused on our students' success. We want our students to graduate and you want them to graduate as lawyers who are also um, a badge of pride for us. So perhaps that's another approach you could take to um, how you re refocus or reframe legal education in Ghana, in different faculties, in universities. Um, and there was um, another point that I think it was Fear Dr. Atifari who talked about uh, the distinction between research and teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, and this, as you know, is also a, a big issue in certain universities in the UK as well, where there are teaching fellows and research fellows, and you know, never the twain shall meet. But 
what we've also learned is from past experience is that research informs teaching and teaching informs research. So giving law lecturers the opportunity to engage in research also enriches teaching and vice versa. Finally, um, I'm reminded of um, McCormick and Murphy from the Open University. They talked about a multidimensional perspective on curriculum design. And there's always a specified or intended curriculum, which is what's in the formal documents, what's framed in the certified documents, all of that. Then there is the enacted curriculum, which is what the teacher takes away from it and how they localize it, as it were, for the classroom that they're in. And of course, this classroom comprises students in every subject with different um, sociological and psychological backgrounds, as Pierre of Platypi has said. And then, of course, there's the experience curriculum. Um, and that is what the student, with their sociological, psychological backgrounds, their different motivations, their experiences, and their challenges actually take away from that specified, from that specified and enacted curriculum. So in terms of what lecturers could bring to the table in reframing legal education could be to look at how they localize it based on their past experiences and also see how through formative assess assessment, students experience the curriculum and use that student engagement, that student feedback to sort of co-create how you take it forward. I know this yeah. sounds very theoretical and quite big in some ways, and it's a massive effort to make it, to implement it, to make it start working. But once you do it, it reaps results, even on a small scale that do snowball. Any, any good thing certainly would require uh, some commitment and effort. Thank, th thank you for those views. But importantly, uh, perhaps on this discussion, our uh, most important view would be the one for uh, Catherine, who happens to be a student and also student leader, vice president of the Law Students Union. Catherine, you've had us discuss how we as law teachers can improve teaching and learning and assessment quality, et cetera. Kumarin has given us uh, the perspectives. You, you live the experience, you and your colleagues in the various law schools live the experience. What, how can the lived experience, your lived experiences influence teaching and assessment reform? You, you, you would have the last word on our discussion before we transition into the question and answer bit and uh, receive comments. Uh, attendees, please note that uh, not just questions, your comments are also welcome. I would read your comments um, towards the end of, of, of our discussion. Yes, Catherine. Okay. Kenneth, thank you very much. Um, first of all, I think most of the lecturers and common, the other panelists have spoken a lot about the constraints, all the constraints I, they have also noticed with the system. So I don't want to hammer on that anymore. I just have a few points. So one, the main aim of the faculties and the entire legal education system is to help students graduate, to help students become lawyers. Now, the question is, are the students graduating happily, in quotes? Mm -hmm. So then, as um, Prof Nkansa mentioned at a point, students come in in the first year with a lot of enthusiasm. And then by the time they are leaving, they are very excited, very happy to be leaving. It's like never to come back, goodbye to all this, because then it, the, the whole system feels like a lot of stress and strain on the students. Mm. If, if that is going to be the case and is going to be, you know, be, be the cycle that's going to be developed, then we, we're going to be having a lot of unhappy lawyers in the future who never enjoy the legal system. And I don't think that's, that's, that's fair. D um, Pure doctor mentioned about the sociology of knowing um, the, the, the entry, the, the, the type of students that you have in your class. A lot of lecturers make no effort at all to know the type of students that they have in their class. And when I'm speaking, I actually made like made calls throughout the past week to other students from different universities and faculties across Ghana who have law departments, law schools, law faculties, and even students from the Ghana School of Law. 
and the, 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 the feeling is mutual. There is no genuine interest in the students as an individual, then to understand the needs of the student. So then you know that maybe with a, some group of students, they work better with audio visuals. So if I'm teaching, let me introduce a bit of audio visuals into my um, teaching methodology. But no, they come and it's just like, I mean, the fact that they are called lecturers doesn't mean they have to lecture. So then it comes and then it's an actual lecture, just blah, 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 blah. End of story, see you next week. No interaction. You know, the student doesn't feel as if you even care to understand if I understood what you were saying. So then there's that aspect. Then um, I think um, Prof also touched a bit on Sorry, it was still doctor, a pure doctor who touched a bit on um, the assessments. Okay, so now we, we wonder, does the current um, assessment method show a true reflection of what students uh, have their strengths in or what a student's strength is? So then it's remember, it's recall. What if I don't have a retentive memory? I, I, I don't look at a page and remember everything on it. I'm better at speaking. I'm better at, I have better oratory skills, better writing skills, better research skills. But then there's nothing in the assessment um, methods being used today that seek to explore all these other aspects of a student's strength. It's, it's mainly focused on memory, memory, memory. So then it reflects in the way the, the assessments are done. Hardly do we have presentations made in class, projects work, quizzes, tests, nothing of the sort. Then at the end of the day, there's a 100% examination where you're supposed to recall everything that you've learned over 12 weeks in four hours, <laughs> sorry, three hours. And I mean, it's, it's a bit unrealistic because then we consider when, um, a whole lot of um, schools had to become innovative during the coronavirus period. How realistic was that three hour session for examinations? Hardly anybody did that because then you, 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 you know it's, it's just not going to work. You had to give I'm, more time to the students to be able to do more within that period. I'm glad, so I'm that glad that you, you bring in COVID. Post, pre-COVID and post-COVID, are the sentiments different with the way faculty interact with students in terms of teaching and learning and assessment design? The, the views vary, mm. honestly, the views vary. Um, some felt post-COVID was better, some felt pre-COVID was better. Mm. So I, I can't really say one particular um, I, I can't stick to one particular view and say mm. that was the general view, because then again, like I said, I'm speaking for the general view. But I do believe pre-COVID, majority felt pre-COVID was better. Post-COVID, with the whole virtual being far away, not um, being able to see and even talk personally with lecturers, and then when you have issues with the way the, the online learning and online examination was being conducted, the mode of communicating those issues and the feedback that you got were not too encouraging. Mm -hmm. So then I would say that um, pre-COVID was better in the majority's view. And so then we should be exploring those aspects as well because what if Corona does not go until 2023, 2024, 2025? We may be looking at many years of virtual learning to come. What measures are the um, lecturers, faculties, deans going to put in place to ensure that the teaching methodology, the quality and the, 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 the current level that it is will be maintained during this period? It doesn't fall, it doesn't become worse. Students don't get worse grades during this period, what measures are being put in place and, and what is going to be done about it to tackle both the teaching and assessment methodologies in mm -hmm. these periods. So I think 
like I said, a lot of the constraints have already been put forward. And um, I believe that as a consumer, then we look up to, in quotes, as a consumer at the receiving end, then we are looking at those at the given end, the deans, the lecturers, the faculties, the schools, to actually look at all these constraints and then implement the reformations that we, 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 we are all discussing and we all seek to have so that the entire quality of the legal education is raised. So if, if, the standards if, if I, are raised. Mm, mm. Yes. If, if I understand you correctly, uh, then you, you, you say that lecturing only is a limited form of instruction. That's the feedback we are getting. And also that students should be tested in a, in a wider range of competencies. So that, so that the average law students, what, what we test you must reflect the competencies that we would expect you to have as a future lawyer, negotiations, public speaking, writing, and not just recall or writing as, as, as is the focus now. Yes, so what okay. might we learn from new is there any recommendation in a minute is there any recommendation on perhaps new assessment forms that may be introduced okay kevin so it's a blend i think mm -hmm. they can do a blend because then some faculties are doing some and some aren't doing some so to ensure i know that then with the um 100 examination you are trying to ensure that your students have understood everything that you um, taught them throughout the entire um, semester or academic year. So why don't we have weekly tests or quizzes? Then you ensure that what you taught last week, the student has been able to assimilate it over the week and then understood it to speak mm. to it. Why don't we have IAs, interim assessments in the middle of the semester? Let's look at everything that you've done halfway how have you understood it? Then the lecturer even knows, should I go back? Does this mean that they haven't understood it? Instead of just going forward, 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 then get to a point and then somebody doesn't understand what was talk, taught in week two and then it draws the entire class back. Mm. Let's talk about presentations. Giving students presentations, number one, that will teach them the skill of research. Then you give them a topic, you, you give them the platform to actually go out there research on the topic and come back and present. During the presentation, you are testing the student's oratory skills, the student's public speaking skills, which are all yes. aspects and skills that are expected of advocates. Yes. But yes. Then you are training lawyers to be advocates. So then these, these um, um, skills are required. But then if you don't assess these skills, how are you going to be sure that the people you are graduating and the people you are passing out as lawyers are going to have these skills so i can only i can only entirely agree with uh, the sentiments uh, i know that this is a passionate conversation that is important to the both the managers the teachers and the students i would like us to transition uh, 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 into the our q a to to give room to our attendees uh, wilma say who has been with us uh, since the very beginning says, good day and thank you for this conversation. I would like panelists views on using experienced practitioners who do not necessarily have PhDs, which seems to be the standard for teaching in the university as adjunct faculty. I think Pure Dr. Tupar responded to that point that perhaps we should think outside the box in, 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 in examining, you know, uh, experienced practitioners who can provide perspectives. Uh, Kwabna Japon Osebuns who says, uh, is asking, uh, do you think the rapid proliferation, and, and panelists, I'd like you to note some of these questions out. Do you think the rapid proliferation of private law faculties in the country poses a limitation to the quality dispensation of legal education? It is something we, that can be, I would hope that a, a panelist would take in about 30 seconds. We are fast running out of time. Leonard Anote says that legal education in Ghana is primarily focused on passing examination through rote learning. There's little or no practical aspect attached. We, how can we move away from this rote learning? I think what Kumarin has said is that it would come from assessment design. If, if the assessments are designed in a way to prevent rote learning, that can be achieved. Now, Janet Gatte uh, uh, asks a question whether formal training is given to law lecturers 
before their commencement of teaching the subject. I think at some point, uh, Prof. Encounter responded that we should give more specialized training to our law lecturers post post the commencement of that uh, of their contracts to 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 situate them better in in the education landscape. Um, uh, Ernest Ako has a question for Prof. in Cancer and Pew Dr. Tupai. So I'd like, please, Prof. and Pew Dr. Tupai, I'd like for you to load this question down. How do we incentivize lecturers to ensure that law, law teachers stay in the classroom, prepare well for lectures, and publish papers and books? Lecturers go to the same market as their students who become lawyers. And, this, and these students earn more than these lecturers in their very first year as lawyers. I think Pew Doctor already made that point. Do we sign a contract to be poor just by becoming good teachers after spending our lifetime savings in acquiring a PhD in law? So I'd like for both of you to uh, address that when I'm done. Jake Mentor says that the Legal Profession Act uh, was passed in 1960 to meet the demands of the time as confirmed by the history narrated by Prof. Nkansa. It's been 50 years now, and things have significantly changed. The dean of the University of Ghana School of Law is a member of the General Legal Council, and perhaps the only dean member, because at the time it was the only school running the law program. We need to uh, have more schools running the course. Isn't it time to amend Act 32 to include deans from other faculties? Representation is a key feature of democracy. Um, so uh, the, on, on the main questions uh, on the proliferation of private law faculties and whether that would affect quality, uh, Pure Doctor, I'd like for you to answer that. And then on uh, how, how can we practically incentivize uh, law teachers to stay in the classroom? Prof, after Pure Doctor goes, I'd like for you to respond to that quickly. Yes, Pure Doctor, please. Okay, Ken. Um, my my view is that not necessarily, uh, mm -hmm. not necessarily the case that the proliferation of private law schools uh, in the country will lead to a reduction in quality of, of legal education. Mm -hmm. um, if you take into account common admission standards, that is the accreditation board as well as the general legal council, who are the principal regulators of this uh, sector. If they take into account common admissions uh, standards in the country, um, that is cuts across. That is both public and private. We are not going to have um, a problem with quality at all. And, and of course, um, we should take into account um, the point I made earlier on, that do we really have a need based recruitment policy for the faculties? So the fact that you are a private uh, university, a private faculty um, of law in the country uh, does not mean that it, it is an open um, range, free range for you to employ anybody into any department of your faculty. So when you are employing, uh, do you really need the private law person? Do you really need the public law person? For instance, are you employing a criminal law aspect to teach uh, thought? Are you employing a company law aspect to, to come and teach uh, land law. Uh, mm -hmm. If you don't have those mismatches, uh, if you don't have people teaching what they're not supposed to be teaching at the private law faculties, you're not going to have a problem um, uh, with quality. And no, number three, we should understand the, the essence of assessment. And this is, it cuts across. Assessment, um, particularly when you are dealing with students assessing lecturers. Mm -hmm. How serious do institutions, the law faculties, the teachers, take into account or take seriously these, these comments from the students. Because you've been assessed every year. You've been told that you are bad in the class. Has that been brought to your attention? What did you do with that? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and have you changed? Is there any, uh, any way of knowing that the person has changed or the person has not changed? And, and the students in particular, we need to understand this because when, when you are dealing with this quality, quality thing, this, the focus seems to be on the lecturers, faculty, we don't, we don't really get to the students to, 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 to find out whether or not some of these our students have made good use of the time given to them. Are you in the library Facebooking? Are you WhatsApping? Are you, have you downloaded movies on your, your phones and watching instead of reading your legal material? Have you paid attention at all? Is your mind on the course? 
are, are you 50-50? That is, you are, you, your leg is in the classroom, another leg is in town working. Have you, have you been running around town without paying attention to the course content? And, and that, that actually comes in when you are assessing lecturers. So it becomes facial assessment. He's fantastic. What's that the meaning of that? What's the meaning of he's fantastic? He's good. He's not good. You know, all of these things are labels without flesh. So the person is not able to appreciate um, what, what kind of um, uh, measures the person should, should, should be taking. So in as much as I agree with Cameron that giving effective feedback is important. And I actually disagree that we should use it as a platform to castigate people. It is not to go and blame people, uh, to go and tell the person that you are really weak, you are not going anywhere, all kinds of things. So I leave your, your office dejected, depressed, and I'm probably is the context for me watching movies in order to get my mood back. But if it is a, it's a, it's a case where you really are going to discuss the paper, what the person has written, and nothing more than that, provide quality uh, feedback to the student to understand, I'm sure we will be on, uh, uh, on a, in a, in a, in a way to get in a, a proper context for legal education. And so in that event, or in the context of all of this, proliferation of private law schools is not necessarily the case that it will lead to weakness unless we resulted in this kind of um, admitting people we're not supposed to admit um, mm -hmm. because we don't have the common admission standards or we allow people to teach who are not supposed to teach in terms of qualification because there are, there are reports in the country where people who have just come out of law school and been called to the bar has to teach final year students, not, not just um, uh, first years. They are asked to teach level 400 LLB students. That, that can have a problem in terms of quality um, mm -hmm. because he's not experienced. He's not the one who has been exposed to some kind of teaching methodologies. This assessment methods that we're discussing, he, he, he's not even aware of the dynamics and things like that. Uh, uh, and, that, and that would be a problem. If you don't use assessments from students to, 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 to be able to be serious with it, because when they made assessment, the forms are somewhere. There's a unit in the department and in the, in the university that is responsible for collecting that information and giving them to the, the, to the lecturers. This is what your students have said about you. Is there a follow up? What have you done since we told you this 2012 that you have been, the students have been saying you are bad, you are bad, you are bad. Have you changed? We, 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 I guess so. So, so the, the point then is that uh, be, uh, it's not just the number of faculties, but we should take academic academic quality control very issues seriously. more seriously. Ken, that's across, very important. That is very, very yeah. important. That's very important. Thank you. Thank, yeah. thank you, uh, Pew Doctor Atupai. Uh, Prof. Nkanta, so on incentivizing uh, <laughs> lecturers to stay in the classroom, I have a, I have a comment by Adele Mensa who says that. I think another reason why most lecturers don't have time for students is because they are also busy with their daily duties of being a lawyer. Can't we have a group of well-paid lawyers whose sole focus will be teaching, or better still, to employ more staff? I think it ties in with, with, that, with, with the main question. Yes, Prof. Kansa, your views on how lecturers may be incentivized to stay in the classroom. Thank you very much. Um, okay, I'm trying to set up my, my thing. I went off. I'm now back. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think it is very, very important that we incentivize them, that the lecturers get incentive for the work they do. A law lecturer, if you work for the government, you sign a contract, your remuneration is already predetermined. When we give you the appointment letter, we state the remuneration, then we require you to accept it, that you will work on the basis of the terms that you have signed. But having said that, there are other ways we can exploit Please do that. Lecturers are given incentives. Apart from their pay from the government, there are certain programs when they are run, 40% of the what comes in is shared for the lecturers across board, if it is a faculty uh, program. And then if you know the web that academics are sitting on, you will be surprised 
at maybe some of the uh, concerns. If there is huge sum of money sitting elsewhere, depending on your field, we call it grant, research grant. If we are able to attract research grant to the university, you get a huge percentage of that. But that will mean that it doesn't come easily. Mm. You have to establish yourself as an academic at the international level in your field of expertise. So that when the, you will be called upon, there is this research. Can you send us your CV? We want to do what? We want to include you. And the remuneration, what comes out of it is huge. But we seem to, our but, work but, has but, to academics. Prof, Prof and Kansa, if, if I may, um, do, do you take the position that the incentives can would only be limited to money? A minute, we're rounding off. Do you, so in a minute, do you think that no. the incentives are only no. limited to money? No. no. Mm. It's just that maybe I thought that the context, they mm. were thinking okay. of you go to the same market. That is market, why I'm yes. concentrating Yes, that was the my, focus. That's uh, true. But, mm. but no recognition, mm. okay. recognition of mm. what they do in the form of awards. Mm. It, some universities and faculties, there was a time, yes, you had to recognize an award. The recognition can be in the form of a, a paper certificate, but it has a far-reaching effect as far as that academic is concerned. So we can recognize what they do and motivate them even by words. I, I mean, apart from giving them certificates, you can have a day of honor and recognize lecturers who did very well and let them mount the podium and shower some citations on them, I think they will be very happy. At the industrial level two, it can be done. Then at the individual level two, it can be done. You can just, oh, thank you very much for this you do, we did for that, you did for that, you did. And they will feel, they will be motivated to do more. We are all human beings. If you hear good words coming from your supervisors and sometimes even from your students, it, the, the words go a long way to motivate you to do extra. But I, I thought that as for the money, I, what, what I was saying, look, mm. you know it as an academic, it's huge. If you <laughs> want to go into research proper, you, you will know what to do with money. It will come. So I want to encourage colleagues that we should, you know, we should take our work as a lecturer seriously. And we should be committed to our work. If we are committed, and it's not just one aspect, the teaching is one, research is another, then uh, 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 community uh, engagement is also another. If we just keep ourselves to the research, we will not even grow, we won't even develop. We will just stay at our corner and then go on retirement and be so much dissatisfied. I know uh, our faculties allow for people to uh, to practice. Mm. Our faculties of law, I don't. I, I mean, lecturers. So lecturers have their chambers and they go there, they practice, and also the practice, the experience, they use it to improve what they do in class. But all I'm saying is that 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 one. There's a level of uh, 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 yeah. Government de determines the rate. But there was another thing I wanted to, I'm sorry if there is time. Uh, Prof, we we are slightly okay. behind time as, as but if okay. you can only make it in a few words, I'm happy to, to have you co uh, conclude. All, all I'm trying to say is that as lecturers, we should mm. actually exercise leadership in what mm. we do. As a lecturer, our students look up to us in every aspect of how we go to class, the preparation we make before we go to class. It's obvious when we go and we are not prepared, they see through it. See, and then how that. we engage the environment, the environment we create for them, and the assessment has come up, 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 up. It's not about us. Yes. It's about engaging to see that 
We have multiple approaches. It's not only examination. Maybe I think the focus has been that is only examination. No, in our universities and also by national accreditation, we it have examination for 70, no, for 70 percent mm -hmm. and Thank continuous you, assessment 30 percent. So I wanted to just uh, bring that aspect that we don't just do 100 percent exams. We have 30 percent of continuous assessment, which is sometimes presentation, miss them, uh, uh, writing of uh, uh, papers, and then assignment, multiple quizzes, you know. So all these uh, go into the 30 percent before we have the 70 percent. So thank, thank you, you very much. Concentrate thank on you. what you're doing and we'll get rich. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would give the last word to uh, Kumarin first in, in a minute, Kumarin, if your final remarks, and then Catherine would have uh, the very last say uh, before we round up the, today's event. Kumarin. Thank you, Kenneth. Um, it's been a really interesting discussion. I'm also just looking a bit of a Q&A. And there was uh, one student who um, has said that one uh, commenter has said that students should be treated as uh, customers and lecturers should no longer be a customer. And uh, this also kind of chimes in with what Catherine said earlier about how um, not all students are built to read, write, and remember and, and uh, kind of regurgitate the information. And uh, something that we could keep in mind, bear in mind in the entire discussion is that there are different different uh, uh, multiple intelligences. People yeah. acquire and um, process knowledge in different ways. Yeah. And that's one part of it. And the other part is that people also have different learning styles and different time management styles. And yeah. you know, this is not exact science, but it is useful to know that there is this framework when we as teachers and curriculum de developers are building the curriculum for our students. And also now that everyone just as we don't all teach in the same way, we also don't um, learn and process that knowledge and um, apply it in the same way either. So that sense of diversity is really important to bear in mind when we are um, developing curricula for students, especially when they come from really a broad range of sociological and psychological backgrounds. Thank you very much, Kumari. Catherine, please. Thank you very much, Kenneth. Um, I think on behalf of all students, and I'm sure all students listening, we have heard what um, Kumarin, Pio Doctor, and Prof have said today. We will also do our part to dedicate ourselves to the learning of the law, and we hope that they, as our lecturers and our teachers and our mentors, will take all this into consideration and actually work to help us learn the law better. Thank you. Um... Uh, viewers and attendees, I, I, at the beginning of our session today, I was confident that we had a fantastic panel to review our uh, discussion today on the reform of teaching and assessment in legal education in Ghana. I think the last uh, a little below two hours has been a testament of, of the uh, viewpoint of our panelists. We thank you so much for those of you who have joined us from the very beginning till now. For those who joined us and left us midway, we also thank you. Um, our next panel event in the Law in Crisis seminar series uh, is would be titled Gender and Politics, Women's Political Status and Representation in Ghana. This is happening on the 19th of November 2020, so just next week. The introduction of the next panel is Gender and Politics, Women's Political Status and Representation in Ghana, happening on the 19th of November, 2020. Um, whilst this has been a very spirited discussion, we may have to end today's uh, series on a fairly sad note. Uh, over the course of the event, we have learned of the passing of the first president of the Fourth Republic of Ghana, uh, Flight Lieutenant Retired Jerry John Rollins. Uh, it's a, it will be a sad time for the nation. We send our condolences to his family and the rest of the nation at this point. We thank you so much for joining us. This has been the Law in Crisis seminar series organized by the University of Ghana, supported by GIZ. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>